going to do that. Wonderful. Okay. So um, as you already said, I've been doing furnished rentals a long time. And when I started it, it wasn't really on purpose. I had bought a triplex that had some furnished rentals and those weren't the high quality ones that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I started doing other short-term rentals in 2017. And the reason for it was really because I had a garden suite, which was quite small. And I realized a lot of tenants couldn't get their furniture into it. So I thought, well, I might as well try furnished. And I was lucky, I got my builder to stage the suite for me because they had never built one, put the furniture in. And I said, hey, I might like to buy this from you. So that's how I actually started in newer furnished suites was by kind of by accident just to try it out because it was December, it was a little tricky. So I'm gonna talk about why you might wanna add furnished rentals to your portfolio. And it really does depend what neighborhood you're in to see if it makes sense. I'm also going to give tips on how to save money because I am an accountant and that's kind of the focus I give is how you can save money if you're doing this. Some things you should consider if you want to do short term rentals. So furnished rentals can be long term. We'll talk about that, but they can also be short term. And then I'm going to talk about uh, items you should consider as well as the software that can help you automate if you decide to do short term rentals and what the rules are in Edmonton specifically for short term rentals and some of the changes that have recently happened. So one of the houses I have, I have a picture right here. This is one I just added on to Airbnb because I was staying in this property. It used to be unfurnished, just to tell you, it rented for $15.75 plus utilities for the upper suite, basement suite separately rented long term. So I furnished it because I was living in it when I was in Canada from Belize. And then when I came back to Belize, I decided to put it on a on Airbnb. And I'll talk about some of the results of that, which are really, really good. So when you're doing short-term rentals, like who are your tenants going to be? So I'm going to give some examples of what I've seen. I have right now five different properties that are short-term rented, and I've bought and sold many different ones over the last few years. So one thing I get is I get corporate execs that are coming into town for work. So my properties are in West Edmonton. So I've had people that are in Atchison, people that are in West Edmonton, and anywhere else that are coming in maybe for a month, up one month to three months, the trends... Uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, for example, was right outside. So I had a lot of people on that project staying in my properties. I've had people that have uh, insurance claims. Insurance people are coming to fix their house. They need a place to stay. People that have renovations going on in their house, they need somewhere. They don't want to be there while it's under renovation. A lot of people right now are selling their houses. I've even just talked about why that's happening. And people are trying to build a house or buy a new one. I have one tenant in a furnished rental where it's actually a house. And he basically said, okay, my lease is up in March, but I don't know, like my builder says it'll be ready in June, but who knows when, so can I extend the lease? So obviously lots of that going on. I've also had people that are recently separated. And a lot of these people, they might just need something for two or three months while they get you know, things uh, finalized in their separation agreement so they can qualify for a new mortgage. And more recently with COVID, there's a lot of nomad workers too that want to try out different places. So when I'm in, I'm in Belize right now, and a lot of people have been moving here from the US and Canada. And one of my friends from the US recently said, oh, well, I might like to go to Canada. Like, are any of your furnished rentals available? Because I'd like to try out Canada for a few months. So you never know who you might get right now coming in, depending where you are. So why would you want to do a furnished suite? So for me, when I'm doing a furnished rental, a lot of times I do it as a long-term or I say midterm, like I'll tell people, hey, you can do a lease for two months, three months, whatever you want, but I can also put it on Airbnb in between. So I might put it on Kijiji and say, you know, it's flexible terms and it's all furnished and ready for someone to stay, but then I can put it on Airbnb in between. So say I have someone coming in for two and a half months, it ends on the 15th, I get someone else coming in on the first, I'll easily just stick it on Airbnb for two weeks, and then I'll get people and get revenue for that time period. But you do have to make sure your insurance allows it. So I have actually, I use TD Malosh Monix most of the time for my insurance. And in the past, when I first started with Airbnb, they said, you can't do it at all with them. So I started using a different company called Sonnet. And more recently with my brand new property, I told them that I was thinking of doing it. And if I did, I'd have to, you know, change insurance companies. They said, actually, you can do Airbnb up to six months. So that was just this uh, earlier, well, last year, I guess, where they said you can do it for six months. So just make sure that you're allowed to do that. Now, another good thing about doing 
uh, furnished suites is you're going to probably get your, your suite cleaned more often. You know, you might turn it over every two to three months or six months. That means you can keep your eye on the property maybe a little better than you otherwise do. If you're kind of the person like me that may just, oh, okay, I'll wait till the lease is up and just go look at it every year. It can also be useful as a vacation property when you're not, uh, when it's not in use. So if you don't have a uh, person in it. Like I said, you could put it on Airbnb. But one thing I've been doing also is putting my houses on home exchange. So home exchange is a platform where people have to put their own house on there. And in my case, I have like five or six, I think I have six houses on there right now. People come and stay in my houses in Belize and in Edmonton, actually, and I get points and then I can go travel free in other places. So I only kind of do that when, you know, it's not really busy to get a booking at a certain place, but it is kind of a nice thing. Now, of course, you're going to hopefully get more rent than doing an unfurnished rental. Otherwise, it's not worth doing. Now, mine generally get at least two to three hundred more than my unfurnished rentals. And that is, of course, if I'm doing it more on a long term or like a long term basis, which six months is a lease in Belize, for example, and all all rentals in Belize are furnished. But in Edmonton, a lot of times, like I said, it might only be three months. Now, with short term, though, it can be even higher. So the house I just set up that I showed the picture of on the last slide, I just got a, well, first of all, first of all, I'll say that I came back to Belize January 26. That's not a busy time in Edmonton. Tourists aren't really coming. My properties are by West Edmonton Mall. But in February and March, I have almost back-to-back -back bookings. I think I had maybe three days not booked in February. And in March, my schedule is back-to-back -back bookings. So in the summer, I just got a booking, uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody booked 51 days in the three bedroom upstairs, which is an upstairs unit, and they're paying, I'm making $5,200 for 51 days. So way better than the 1575 rent plus utilities that I would normally make on the house. So that's one of the advantages. And in my case, I had all the furniture anyway, because I had it in storage. So that made this one a very good deal. So some things to factor in. So when I was setting up my brand new two bedroom units, I spent about, well, it depended on the units. I spent between $7,000 and $10,000. So that was for two bedrooms and it depended where I was buying furniture from. So the picture at the very bottom that you can see that is uh, $67, that's variable pricing, which I'll talk about later. That property is got Ikea furniture. So it's a little bit uh, cheaper. My new tiny home, I have Lazy Boy furniture. So obviously the, you know, depending what you buy, it's going to be totally different pricing. So you do have a lot more items to maintain. So typically your furniture, you're going to have to replace a lot of items probably every five years or so. So you do want to make sure you also put higher repairs and maintenance in your budget. So if you normally budget 10% for repairs and maintenance, obviously if you're doing furnished rentals, you want to factor in the furniture uh, revival uh, uh, that you're going to do. And you also want to make sure you have more insurance for your contents. So when I have insurance on an unfurnished rental, you know, I'm just insuring contents for the appliances. When I have all the furniture, TVs, all those kind of things, obviously that's a lot more valuable. So one other thing is um, if you are doing short-term rentals, it's very helpful to get a mentor when you're first starting out. Uh, when I decided to do it, I was lucky to have Shanna Badry, who was, was the vice president in our group previously. I would talk to her all the time about how she did things, and that really helped me a lot. So make sure you try to talk to people who've done it, because it is a lot different than long-term rentals. So it also requires a lot more time. So I'm going to talk about some of the tasks that I have to do, and this is why I'm very busy with short-term rentals often. So I have to hire and manage cleaners. This is actually quite a nightmare uh, in Belize more so than in Edmonton, but Edmonton is no better. I've just been messaging my cleaner today on, hey, can you make sure there's blue bags? Because I had another guest message me that there's no blue bags to take out the garbage. Um, dealing with snow and ice and lawn maintenance. You know, long-term tenants typically are responsible to do this. Short-term tenants are not. So you need to make sure you do that. And I have a company that does it for me but I had this new property I added on and they said, sorry, we're too busy in West Edmonton. We can't add a new property right now. Luckily I ended up selling one and I'm like, Hey, can you just transfer from that one to this one? So now I got it on there, but for a little while I had a huge issue with that. You also have to make sure you communicate with guests and deal with 
issues promptly. So I had a guest where a smoke alarm battery was beeping and they were freaking out and I got a terrible review on Airbnb because I couldn't get it fixed that exact same day, which I mean, it's kind of impossible to get someone on a weekend to go out and do something. I, I was in police. So anyway, it's uh, you, you have to make sure you have someone uh, available right away to do things. You also typically have to get a business license and follow any municipal rules that exist, which in my in our case, I have ones to follow in Edmonton. And then I also have ones I have to do in Belize. So you also have to commit and collect and remit any taxes that are required. So here in Alberta, we have GST and we have tourism tax that we have to collect. And I'll get into that in some later slides. And also you may want to implement software to help with automation, which I will talk about as well. So what are the recommendations? If you are setting up a furnished rental, whether it's short term or not, you want to have an inventory listing of everything required. This will help you because you can track items as you purchase them and buy items when they're discounted. So I have a template I use as a starting point. So my template is for a two bedroom suite. So I have bedroom one, bedroom two. I have what I need in the bathroom because you know you need everything from little bath rugs to um, you know a toothbrush holder, soap dishes, all those kind of things that you need. So I have that by room. And then easily if I have a three bedroom or I had a one bedroom, I could just take out a bedroom. So that makes it a lot easier, especially for the kitchen. Because when I first set up my first unit, I'd go into it and or I'd get a guest going into it and someone would say, oh, you don't have a corkscrew or you don't have a bottle opener or you don't have a, you know, whatever it is. So there's many different things you need that you want to have on a template. And one other thing you should do if you can is go stay in your unit yourself for a few nights to or, or have a friend do that so they can give you like exactly what the issues are. Hey, the bed's not comfortable. Get an extra, you know, uh, uh, memory foam mattress protector, which I've done in some of my units. So those are all things you can find out better by staying in it yourself or having one of your friends stay in it. Uh, in Belize, I had, I was living in one of my short-term rentals initially and the other unit, I had one of my friends in Belize. I said, just, can you come stay here for about a week with me? Just so you can give me feedback on what it's like and what I need to do. And that made it easier when I had a guest come that they weren't complaining about things because I was able to fix things uh, before I was getting reviews on the property. Also, make sure you have different lists. So what do you need for furniture? What do you need for linens? And if you're doing just furnished but not short term, you want to consider what you want to put in the unit. So for short term units, you need supplies. So you need coffee, you need toilet paper, you need shampoo, you need a ton of things, sugar, um, oil or butter for cooking, a whole bunch of things, salt and pepper, uh, lots of things like that. Whereas if you're just doing furnished rentals, you're probably not going to provide all those kind of supplies. But you have to think about, am I going to include dishes? Because dishes, I've had furnished rentals where I didn't bother doing any kitchen items. I just had furniture. And I was just clear on the on Kijiji or rent board or wherever I was posting that it's a furnished rental, but you still have to provide your own dishes. Ideally, most furnished rentals would have all of those amenities as well. And then the other checklist that I like to have is a cleaning checklist. So when I've hired new cleaners, which I've done it many times since 2017, because cleaners have high turnover and often you have problems with cleaners as well. So you want to have a regular list of what they have to do when they go to clean. So a turnover would be sort of the spot clean of anything that's a problem. Like they're not going to clean every single wall, but they're going to make sure they do a full clean of the kitchen and the bathroom, change all the linens, the bedding, all that kind of stuff. And, but they're then every so often, you're going to want to get a deep cleaning done where they're going to pull out the couch, make sure everything's clean underneath there, make sure the cupboards are cleaned out, all those kind of things. So that would be a, a more, you know, a deeper clean, go through the, uh, the air ducts and make sure those are all cleaned as well, those kind of things. So different checklists to make sure everything's done correctly. And I have had where you know, I've had complaints if cleaning isn't done properly. And I, I already got a comment, someone saying, would I share my inventory list or setup? So certainly at the end, I'll give my contact information so you can request different things that I need. And also I will talk later at the end that everything that I record, I record everything and I do put it on YouTube so you can access the presentation afterwards as well. So some setup tips, and this is specific to what I've done in Edmonton for some of my suites. So 
a lot of times I'm building new properties, which is maybe an advantage. So a lot of times I'm getting possession late in the year, like December, sometimes February. And I often have utilized Canadian Tire. Their weekly flyers have 70% off just a few items. So every week when I knew I was going to get a new property, and this is the same thing if you were buying a property where you knew you were going to have possession in you know, 30 days or two months or whatever it is, I would go into Canadian Tire and I'd look, okay, dishes are this price, you know, a knife block is this price, this is a TV is on sale for this price, it might be Canadian Tire, could be somewhere else. And then I would actually go order it, bring it, you know, pick it up, have it in my supplies, so that once I set up the property, I'd have as many items on sale as I could. And I just check it off on my inventory list so that you know, I know what I'm still missing. And at the end, when I didn't find things on sale, then I would just go through and order everything else missing, usually about a week ahead of when the suite was ready. And then usually I would be able to set up the suite in one weekend. So I'd order all my furniture in advance, I'd have everything I already bought, um, already ready, and I would be able to set up the suite in one week one weekend. So my tiny home, I wasn't even in Edmonton, I had my handyman along with an assistant to him set up everything. So I had furniture delivery happening, I had someone bringing all the supplies that I had in storage that I had ordered. And basically one weekend, the whole suite was set up, and I was able to have my first guest in. So it would take a lot longer if you didn't have inventory lists, and you didn't have all these processes in place. And it took longer when I did my first ones. The other thing I do is I have a direct buy membership and Shanna has this as well. And this is a company that has huge discounts. And I looked at it, I don't even know, maybe 20 years ago and it was thousands of dollars to buy a membership. And then I had a family member that had it where she said, oh, it's only a few hundred dollars a year. And I went, what? So I ended up going in, checking out her website that she was using for it. And I ended up buying in my tiny home, for example, you can look at pictures. I have the blinds that go up and down. You can have it like go like it's bottom up, top down kind of blinds. So you can have light at the top of the window rather than the bottom. And those are quite expensive. And I got pricing from Costco and my direct buy membership was way cheaper to buy blinds. I also bought a bedroom set for one of my house furnished rentals where I saved a thousand over a thousand dollars from what I saw of the exact same bedroom suite at Lazy Boy. Not that Lazy Boy is going to be cheap. Um, and even things like uh, backsplash tile, I saved a ton of money on things like that. So there's renovation material as well as furniture and appliances. So you can buy a membership in either Canada or the US. And what was interesting to me, of course, I bought it in Canada, bought all my stuff for well, a lot of the stuff for all my furnished suites. But then when I was setting up my property in Belize, I actually called direct buy and said, hey, can you set up my shipping address to be in Houston? And I ordered stuff direct by that way and had it shipped. I have a shipper from Houston that goes right to Belize. So I was able to buy stuff through direct buy that way as well. Now, if you are ever interested in direct buy, make sure you message me first because you actually get credits if you do it through a referral. So my family member that had it basically got credits and I also got credits that was basically money that you could spend right, right off the bat. So it's uh, very, very interesting if you're furnishing rentals or if you, even if you're furnishing your own house, the direct buy membership can be very useful. Another thing I use for my supplies for short-term rentals is Amazon subscribe and save. So I order a lot of stuff on Amazon anyway, and I didn't even know about subscribe and save in the first, uh, first while. So basically how this works is if you order at least five items each month, you get 15% off all the items. So I order things like soap, cleaning products, toilet paper, and coffee, although they were shorted on toilet paper forever with COVID, but I'm able to get it again now. So you can see if you have uh, more than however many items. So I just went in, this is one of my, um, one of my subscribe and save orders for March 12th. And it says my last day to edit delivery is Thursday, March 3rd. So basically when I set up these items, it'll recommend how often I want them. So you can see jet dry, I just say two units every four months because I don't go through a lot of that. A dishwasher detergent, Tide, uh, shampoo, et cetera. So you can make sure this way that you have items coming in regularly. And every month I just go in and I'll talk to my, into Amazon and I'll talk to my cleaner and say, what do I have in my supply cabinet that I need? Because if I already have tons of Tide because people weren't 
doing laundry other than linens, then I don't maybe need as much as I normally get. So I have one supply cabinet, and this is a recommendation I have, is if you have a location where you can keep supplies where the guests can't get it, that is a little bit better. So I have one of my garages in one of my rentals and they're all close in proximity to each other. So I have a lock box with a key for that supply cabinet right beside it. So the cleaners can just go grab supplies right from the cabinet and supply all the different properties as they're doing the cleanings. So it is a good, good way to save 15% on all the items that you regularly get on Amazon. So now I want to get into talking about some short term rental strategies. So one of the things that I didn't do initially, like when I set up on Airbnb at first, I set the first unit up and I just it asked me what price I wanted and I picked a nightly rate. They did have a thing called smart pricing. It didn't work very well. Um, in comparison to what I learned later. So I do now have really good pricing software. And what it does is it basically does the same thing that airlines do. So if you're booking a WestJet flight, uh, for example, going to Belize, um, I booked some flights that were $800 round trip. Well, now it's March. If I try to book a flight on a Wednesday, uh, one way right now, it's, I don't know, maybe $800. And on Saturday, it's $1,000. Same thing when you book a hotel. If you book a hotel during a peak season in a market, it's going to be way more money typically than if you're booking in a very slow season. So for example, in a market like Canmore, in the summertime, rental rates will be way higher than what they would be in the winter. And this is called variable pricing. And on short-term rentals, that is possible to do as well. So many hotels in the past had rate cards. You know, it would say your hotel cost is going to be, you know, $100 a night or, you know, and they might even have a kind of seasonal rate. So, you know, in the summer, it's 150 a night and in the winter, it's 75 a night, but they wouldn't change it every night. What pricing software allows you to do is take different nights and change the price based on events in the area. So there are times where one of my properties that's normally a base price of 50 or $60 a night is all of a sudden 150 and it's a Tuesday night in the winter. I don't know why this Tuesday night is busy, but for some reason it is and the pricing software knows. So typically it could be something, for example, if it's a conference in a certain area, if, if, everywhere else is charging more money, the pricing software kind of figures that out. So it basically has many different prices. And what you're able to do too is set your minimum price. So if you know you want, for example, my three bedroom house, I have a price of $100 a night. I don't want to rent it unless it's $100 minimum, but the pricing software, for example, in the summer is well over 100. And then maybe in the winter, it's maybe 100 exactly. And many nights in the winter, it has been 100. And then I can, if the booking isn't going right away, Airbnb will send me a notification saying, hey, do you want to offer a discount, which I will often do. So, you know, I might end up renting it for 90 some dollars a night. The other thing the pricing software does is it also allows me to automate stay restrictions. So normally I don't want someone coming in for one night all the time because I'm going to need a cleaner every day. It's just administratively hard. There's so much linen and utilities are higher. So maybe in some cases you might want a minimum two day. Maybe you want 30 day. Maybe you want seven. Whatever it is you want, you can set it. So in some cases, I might want to allow two day minimum stay during peak season, which is what I actually personally do. So in the summer, I make a lot of money. So if someone wants to come stay for two nights, I will let them do that. But then what I might do for next winter is I don't want someone booking three nights and then I can't get a long term like a two month, a corporate guest wants to stay for two months. I can't have it because I have this one guest that booked for two nights. So what I will do is say, OK, I want people to be able to book two days minimum from now for the next 90 days. And after that, I want minimum of 30 days or minimum of seven. Whatever it is you want, you can set it in the software to do that. Another example is I might want to have in a property, maybe I only want a week booking. I want seven days all the time, just because maybe my cleaners only want to clean once a week typically. But then if you had someone book from Sunday to Sunday and then another person booked Wednesday to Wednesday and you have a few days in between, that's called an orphan day booking in my software. And you can just say, OK, well, I'm going to let people book for one day or two day, whatever you want, as long as there's an orphan booking, like there's there's a there's days in between two existing bookings. 
So the software I use, you are allowed to try free for 30 days. So I've put the QR code there if you want to try it out just to see how it works. So I tried out three different softwares be before I decided on which one to use. And some of them just had lower prices that they set. Some of them didn't have as much flexibility. Some of the pricing is different. So some of them have fixed pricing where you pay monthly no matter what. Some of them change the pricing per uh, your revenue. And I don't really want a revenue-based uh, fee. I want something per property if I'm using their pricing software. So the one I use is it's a minimum fee of each property. And then I just pay that amount and I can toggle it off. So if I have a guest staying in a property for six months, I don't care about having the price software where software working, so I can toggle that off and not pay for that at all. But when I'm using it, it is a fixed fee, not all that expensive. So if you wanna try that out, if you do have short-term rentals, it can save you a lot of time. Initially, I had some people that told me they were going in manually to adjust pricing. So they knew that, you know, things are a little busy in the summer and then maybe the falls, you know, a little less busy, but more busy than the winter. So they were manually adjusting pricing. And in the past, um, the pricing software I used only worked with Airbnb, and now it actually works with Airbnb, Verbo, and Booking.com. So I, I have ways I do that through all the integrations of many different softwares, but basically I'm able to adjust my pricing in, many, in all the different platforms that I use for my rentals. The other thing that I use is communication software. So initially, I had to do so much work. So even when I had one prop, one property wasn't that bad. I'd have a guest book. I'd have to send them a thanks for booking. Here's the address. Here's directions. Here's how you access the suite. Here's the check-in. Here's the checkout. Uh, don't forget to take the garbage out because it's garbage day. All those kind of things. And then on top of that, I, I kept, kept a Google sheet of every single guest. I would say, you know, John's checking in from, you know, March 1st to March 5th. And checkout time is always 11. And I would put it in a Google sheet and I had the multiple suites at one point. And then I would just say to the cleaners, here's the Google sheet. You can see when you have to go in and clean. But I had to do this manually all the time. So this was a ton of work. So the communication software I use now, every property I have, I set up an initial booking message that goes out and it'll automatically go out to every guest. As soon as they make a booking, it'll say, thanks, John, for booking this particular property on these particular dates. Here's the check-in time. Here's the directions. Here's the Wi-Fi code. Here's whatever information people ask me about all the time. I send it to them automatically. So Wi-Fi is a thing. It's on Airbnb. Nobody finds it. They all ask. So I started putting that in the check-in instructions that go out automatically. The day before checkout, people might forget checkout's 11 a.m. So now automatically the day before they check out, they will get a message saying, hey, your checkout time tomorrow, like, you know, hope your stay is great. Your checkout time's 11 tomorrow. Please make sure you do X, Y, Z before you check out, et cetera. So it does that very easily. The other thing it does is as soon as a guest books a property, it sends a notification to my cleaner. And I mean, I had to set this all up initially, but the cleaner, I don't even, I don't even talk to the cleaners about when guests are checking in and out at all. So my cleaner, the company I'm using now, they get all the notifications, they can access the software, see when people are checking in and checking out and automatically go through and do all the bookings. So I do have a QR code if you want to try out the software I use. They also have the ability to set up direct booking websites. And if you use my QR code there, you can save $10 US on your invoice. And obviously, automation is good. If you have one property, maybe you don't need to do automation initially. But once you have a few, it makes things way easier. So I often have guests call me now where they're like, oh, I'm having a problem with this. It's like, okay, what property are you in? I mean, I have six different suites that are being booked sometimes. So it can be very hard to know. So luckily, most of the time, stuff is going out to them automatically, and I get way less questions than what I used to get before I had this process. Another really big thing that I started using recently is on door locks. So initially, when I had my Airbnbs, I set up a key code, and I would change the key code on it, you know, every couple months 
because I didn't want to do it every stage that I have to, you know, get the cleaners to do it. And I have to then message the guests for it. And it's a lot of work, right? So I didn't want to do that. Now what I do is I have Yale locks with August software. And I like these ones for many reasons, but they, you can only buy them at Best Buy. It's one of their specific products. But the good thing about this is it integrates with Airbnb. Unfortunately, not with Verbo or the other uh, platforms I use, booking.com. But so those ones, I still have to set up door codes myself and send it to the guests. But with Airbnb, as soon as someone books, they will get an email saying Airbnb has partnered with August and Yale. Here is your code that's only valid from 4 p.m. till 11 a.m. at checkout. So I highly recommend that because that saves me a ton of time. I mean, I could have in just one suite, I think in one month, I often have 10 different guests. And if you multiply that by five properties or six properties, there is an enormous amount of door codes to set up and message to guests. So this is a huge uh, time saving for me to do this. So now what I do at the beginning of the month is I go in and I look on my, um, my communication software actually shows the calendar for all of my different platforms. So it'll show Airbnb bookings, booking.com, direct bookings and Verbo, which I use all of those. And so then I'll just go in and be like, okay, the few that are Verbo or booking.com or direct bookings, I will just set up codes for those on my phone and send it to the guest. So even though I'm in Belize right now, if a guest couldn't get in or they wanted to check in at 3 p.m. and the software is only set up four, which is check-in, I can actually unlock the door from my phone in Belize to open my property in Edmonton. So this software is very, very good. Uh, there is one other door lock I use in Belize just because this software needs Wi-Fi. And in Belize, it might be a little bit harder to... Um, have Wi-Fi always working. It generally does, but sometimes it isn't. So I do have a lockbox, a different type that I use for properties where um, it has a key in a lockbox and it still integrates with Airbnb and sets up an, a code separately for each guest. And I know Shanna uses that in some of the condos she manages where you can't actually put a separate door lock on a condo building. So the lockbox where you have a key in it, she just leaves somewhere else where the guests can go take the key, but they still have their own code. So definitely for pricing, communication, and door locks, automation is very important to try to, I guess, try to make the business a little bit more manageable. Otherwise, for me, I had a full-time job and I was doing short-term rentals, probably would have been very impossible to do this if I didn't have all the automation. So now I'm going to get into some of the short-term rental rules in Edmonton. So I have a link there that you can click if you want to see the short-term rental application process. So in Edmonton, you do have to apply for a business license, and there's two different paths in Edmonton. So one is if you don't reside at the property. So in my case, I have a house and a garden suite on all my properties or a house with a basement suite, and none of them I live at right now because I'm living in Belize. But if I lived at one, it's a little bit harder, actually. So if I don't reside at the property and I want to put the garden suite on Airbnb, which is what I do, and then I have a long-term tenant in the house, what happens is I just pay the fee and there's a little application. You do it all online, you pay your fee and you get your license. So it's actually pretty simple and it's under $100 to do this every year. So it's not crazy. And now I just renewed one of mine in January and I was actually able to pay two years in advance. So that was easy. And right now they actually have half price on business licenses. So I think I was paying $47 for my business license. So really affordable there. Now, if you do live at the property and you have more than two sleeping units as a short term rental, you also need to pay for and get a home occupation development permit. So it's kind of a stupid thing where you're living on the property, but you actually have to do more work than if you don't live at it, in it at all. One of the changes in 2022 is that when you renew a business license, you also need an operational plan for your Airbnb. So this has resulted pretty much because of a lot of complaints on different party houses in Edmonton, where the police were called or uh, neighbors are contacting their counselors saying, I don't want Airbnbs in Edmonton at all. I have people coming to have parties at all these houses. So the operational plan basically talks about how you're going to manage different things. So, you know, you could have things in there like having 
cameras to make sure outside the property, the people that were booking were the people who said they were booking. They don't have 10 extra people coming into the property. Do you have noise software? You know, do, are the phone numbers presented to the neighbors so they can call you if there's any problems so the city doesn't get involved? All those are kind of things that you put in your operational plan. And it is basically something probably just to make it so that the city won't say, forget it, you can't have Airbnbs at all. So some, some jurisdictions, you're not allowed to do Airbnb or short-term rentals at all. So in Vancouver, for example, I was talking to a person there who has garden suites like I do in Edmonton. And he said, if you have a separate garden suite, you cannot Airbnb it, period. No separate property is allowed to be Airbnb. So this was some time ago, those rules can change all the time. But the only way they were allowed to do Airbnb is if they were doing it on a bedroom in their individual house. So totally flexible in Edmonton to do this. It's just you have to follow the rules. So there is an Alberta tourism levy that is fairly new. So this means you have to collect 4% from your guests and then remit that to the government of Alberta. So I created a course on how it works because it was really crazy when they first implemented it. We had one week, I don't even know if it was a week, it was about a week notice where all of a sudden the government of Alberta said, by the way, you have to start doing this. Airbnb didn't even know it was happening. So Airbnb had a meeting with hosts off the bat saying, hey, get online. We got online and they're like, you have to do this. They didn't really know how to do it either, nor did anyone else. So it was quite an onerous process just to set everything up initially and get it done. It's, it's not really hard to do after you've set it up, but at first you have quite a process. So if you are setting up for the first time, you can take a look at my course I've done on that. The other thing a lot of people don't know is GST is applicable on short-term rentals. So long-term residential rentals are exempt from GST, but short-term rentals are not. And sorry, I should have mentioned the, the tourism thing that we just talked about. Same thing. If it's long-term rentals, you don't have to collect the 4%. And that's on stays of 28 days or more for that tourism 4%. So for GST, obviously long-term rentals, we know we never collect GST. But if you have a short-term rental, that is not exempt from GST. So you are able to uh, ignore GST if your income is going to be less than $30,000, but I would suggest you still register it for, it for it anyway. And the reason for that is because you could then collect the GST from your guests and remit it to CRA. So you're getting extra for the reservation, you give it to CRA. And the benefit of doing this is that you get GST back on all your expenses. So when I'm ordering everything on Amazon, like coffee and toilet paper and all that, I'm paying GST on that. Same thing with all my furniture, I'm able to get the GST back on all that against the GST I collected from my guests. So that's why I would recommend registering for GST because you get that credit back on all your expenses, which we don't get obviously on long-term rentals. So that is one reason you might wanna register for GST. And I know someone says, does this also apply uh, to the full GST on the purchase price if buying a short-term rental? So um, when you're buying the rental, that's a good question. So if you're buying it, there is different rules with GST. So and you get a GST rebate on new properties anyway for residential use, depending on the price of the property. So it's, it's, there's not a yes or no answer to that question directly. Basically what happens is the GST rebate on a brand new property is only if you buy a property under a certain dollar value. So if your property costs over 450, you're not allowed to get any GST new home rebate. If it's between 350 and 450, you get part of it. And if it's under 350, you get all of it. Um, this is a, I have a, I think I have a whole presentation on GST for um, building new properties. It's a totally separate topic. But the other thing to uh, note is if you're building a house with a garden suite, you actually have two separate buildings. So this applies where you have to split the cost of the house from the garden suite. And if each of those is under the 450, you are able to get a GST new home rebate. So that is a huge benefit to garden suites over basement suites. So for a house with a basement suite, CRA doesn't consider it two units that are separate for GST new home rebates. But when you do a house with a garden suite, because it's a separate building, you actually could get a huge amount back. And Zoria can comment on this because she got GST rebates on her houses with garden suites, as did I. So um, on my in 
my case, most times I was getting between $7,000 and $10,000 back from the government on the GST for the purchase of a new property. And if it's a pre-owned property, you don't pay GST, so you don't get it back. So that's why it was a kind of a bigger topic. So hopefully that answers uh, Evelyn's question there. And she just sent it directly to me. But um, anyway, so I'll check the questions at the end as well, which is coming up. But how do I register for GST is another question. So that is through CRA. And I can you know, help you with that a little more in person. So, or on, on the phone, because it is quite a process to do initially. So that was pretty much the end anyway. So um, I can get into any other questions. Before I go through other questions on the chat, do, do anyone have, does anyone have any questions they wanna bring up specifically? Hello, uh, question for you. Have you ever done like an Airbnb arbitrage where you rented a unit, then furnished it, then rented it out again and uh, collected that difference? I have not, but I know people who have, and that is a huge topic on some of the Facebook groups that I'm part of and investing groups. So you can definitely find short-term rental arbitrage groups on Facebook, actually. And I, I do know somebody in Edmonton who did try that in a really nice neighborhood where she was paying a lot of rent and she ended up losing a lot of money. So be careful if you do it. But in some markets, it is a very great strategy to do. So if you can check, so I have a I have a separate presentation on YouTube actually about how to look up Airbnb rental rates. So I didn't want to go into too much in this, well, because we don't have time forever to do this, but I have a whole presentation on doing performas and things for Airbnb. And I show you how to look up results on AirDNA on one of my YouTube presentations. So if you watch that and you can see what the AirDNA results are, you have to pay for a subscription to do that for different markets. But if you know that you're going to make a lot of money to cover all your expenses, definitely you can do that. But make sure that it's okay with your landlord or your condo board if it's in a condo. So many places will not allow you to do that. Um, so does that answer that question? Uh, yes, thank you. No problem. And if anyone else has done that, feel free to pipe up if anyone on the call has actually done the arbitrage situation. Nobody says they are. So my YouTube channel name actually is just go to youtube.com Linda Hayes. It's very simple. And I have, I think, I don't even know. I think I have 437 subscribers, primarily because I do a lot of videos on Belize, which is a huge topic that's needed. But I put playlists here for the area meetings because I'm posting those in a special playlist. I also have ones on real estate investing. And then I have lots on Belize as well. So um, if you go into the real estate investing one, you should be able to find the one on the Airbnb and figuring out the pro formas. So that's the YouTube ch channel name, seeing what else. Someone also said, does registering, uh, is it different if using the personal name versus corporation? And it absolutely is. So when I bought a property in my personal name, and I've done both. So my personal name properties, when I bought those, I did the GST no home uh, rebate, and that was fine. But when I was doing Airbnb, initially, when I bought a property in my corporation, I said it was a business and I got the full GST back as an input tax credit. So when you're doing it in, corpor in a corporation and you're registered, you actually get way more GST back than the new home rebate. Because the new, rebate, new home rebate is only 36% of the GST you paid. So not near as much. In the, the corporation, it's great. Problem is, is as soon as you're doing corporations, with rentals, it actually is a corporation. It's corporate when you're selling it as well. So just keep that in mind. I'm trying to see other questions. There's a question just about um, <clears throat> locations for Airbnb, Strathcona, downtown, you know, what areas of Edmonton? Oh, yes, perfect. So 
you want to make sure that you're in an area that people want to stay, but you also want to make sure it's not oversaturated. So Edmonton has a ton of Airbnbs and you, I mean, you can go, you can buy a membership and look at Edmonton and that's going to be very expensive to do, but all you need to do is go into Airbnb, search for an accommodation, downtown Edmonton, look at the map, see how many are there, see what the pricing is. And what I did when I was looking to decide if I wanted to set up is I would look in that person's calendar to see when it was blocked off. If they have no bookings upcoming, you know there's probably not a lot of demand in that area. Now, it might be they could block it off because they're using it certain periods, so keep that in mind. But certainly, you make sure that you're going to not be oversaturated in the area. And certain uh, places, you can, you can also search by number of guests. So if you wanted a property in downtown, maybe there's tons, and I don't know, I, I, I don't have any downtown, but let's say you look downtown and you're like, there's, you know, 101 bedrooms and hardly any of them seem to have any bookings upcoming. And then you look, like you can keep looking that for a period of time and see the trend on what bookings they're getting in the property. Look at some that are ones that you might like that are in the same type of building or the same type of, uh, you know, location, then you can also just see if people are only having one bedroom. So you can check for two guests, and then you can check for four guests or six guests. And if you see there's some that are six guests, and those are always booked, if you were deciding to buy in that neighborhood, maybe you would want to focus on a three bedroom unit, right, versus just a one bedroom. So that's another thing to check as well. So downtown, I know there is good demand at times for short-term rentals, but I also know the last time I heard there was a lot of them there. My properties are all in West, West Edmonton, so they're close to West Edmonton Mall, so there's some tourism that happens there, plus some of the businesses, and there's River Cree, so there's benefits to that, um, probably by, depending on what city you're in, if you had a really big hospital where lots of people come in to go to, that would be probably popular. So in Edmonton, by the university, you could probably get some people coming in for four months for furnished rentals. So maybe not short term as much, but you certainly could get, you know, four months and things like that where furnished rentals might be a huge benefit. I just want to comment that I have some friends who got into Airbnb after the fact, but um, just paying, if you're thinking about condos, paying attention to the bylaws, because a lot of condos don't allow them. Um, yep. One of my friends had a property in Canmore and uh, also paying attention to what the city is doing around you. If other people are building, because that can impact any changes because um, the, uh, what's it called? I'm forgetting the name. Each area is, um, what's it called when you can only have one bank in here. You can only have a, one school in this neighborhood uh, zone. It's zoned for certain things. So if it's already zoned for a whole bunch of hotels, well, then Air, that, that's just a situation for in Canmore. Um, it was already zoned for hotels or a hotel was coming up or something. So there was no room to have Airbnb because an Airbnb would take away from those, those um, hotels. And so therefore they weren't allowed to do Airbnb. So things like that bylaws and pay attention to what's going on in your neighborhood because things can change depending on what you allow your neighbors to do and build. Yep, exactly. And that's, I, I kind of talked about that a little bit, Barb, with the fact that you always have to check. And right now in Edmonton, we have very favorable, which is great, but condos, it is a huge issue. So you have to check always whether you're allowed. And most times you're not allowed, but you might be allowed to do a furnished rental and you might still be able to get money that way, you know, doing furnished rentals, but they might have a rule. It has to be six months or it might have to be a year. So make sure you check and get it in writing. And in Canmore, um, I know that a little bit too, because Shanna has a lot of property there. And there are some properties that are, sorry, can someone mute there? So in Canmore, for example, they have some buildings that are only short-term rentals and some that could be both and some that are not allowed at all. So every jurisdiction is different. Originally, I wanted to buy property in Las Vegas and I had to research the bylaws and it was an extreme nightmare. And now, now I'm in Belize and you can do it. It's just in Belize, you have to follow exactly what a hotel has to do and you can do it, but it probably takes a year. The realtors certainly never tell you that, but um, it definitely, you can do it, but it takes a long time. So every place you invest, you have to check in details. 
Yeah, and I'm not contesting to someone posted this is short term rental. And yeah, that was the issue is for her across the street was a different zone. Mm-hmm. So they could do it. She just it, it's on one the wrong building. side of the street. Yep. In yeah. and more, it's one building. In some jurisdictions yeah. in Vegas, when I researched it, you could only have one if there wasn't one 600 feet away. And that was at one point. And then they didn't allow it at all. And then they did. So, you, like, I mean, things can change all the time. So if you buy a property specifically for Airbnb, or if you do a one-year lease for rental arbitrage, be very careful that you've been watching what the municipality is doing. So you can, in Edmonton, for example, you can watch the council meetings where there's short-term rentals. You can actually go speak at them. So I went and spoke at Edmonton City Council meetings on on short-term rentals in the past. So you, you can easily do that if you choose to do that, but you can also just watch them. You can look at minutes to see what they talked about and if they have concerns. So we actually have with Shanna's group, we have a huge, um, I guess we work with the city very closely. So they get our input before they do, for example, the operational plan. We all got emails saying, hey, what do you want to have in it? So that's a really favorable market for hosts, whereas other cities, I mean, how do you know what the, I guess, the mindset of council is? So you have to be aware of that before you start. Um, so question, um, I'm on Airbnb. Um, just like I usually have roommates, but then in the summer, um, cause I'm by the university in the summer, I get Airbnb cause they want to go home for the summer. Um, so I had Airbnb for a short term last year and I got an email about the GST. It was my first time doing it. Um, I got an email about the GST, but I mean, it's my residence. I only have two. I don't make 30 K off of them. So I don't, I think when I read, I didn't have to do anything, but then when I got a, I got another email saying, we've sent you, we submitted your information to your GST information to, um, CRA, but I mean, there was no GST information because I didn't have any GST. I never okay. filled that out. So sh- will that be fine? You might want to call CRA and check. Now, Airbnb has sent emails out just the la- in the last couple of weeks saying we are now collecting GST on behalf of the government of, you know, of the CRA. And so make sure you go in if you have a GST number and update it. So going forward, right now, I've put my GST into Airbnb to charge extra. But I think Airbnb is going to start adding that automatically on to guests and, and then remitting it. And that would make it way easier for you. Okay, so that's why you're saying it's probably better for me to get a GST number because I didn't get a GST number because I'm like, why bother? I don't. Right. And you know, it is I only more work because you have to file a, a return, and you might need to get an accountant to help you with doing that. So it is more work. Mm-hmm. But if you do have a lot of expenses with renovating, buying linens, buying towels, buying shampoo and stuff for the suites, you're going to get the GST back on those items, which will help you in the long run. And at the end of the day, if Airbnb is collecting the GST anyway, that has to be remitted. So why not get your GST on your expenses back? So even though you don't have to do it, and it's a bit easier not to, if you want more money back from the government, then you might want to do it. Speaking of GST, can you comment on GST implications when you're selling a home that has been used for short-term rental? Yeah. So if it is some, like if you've basically told the government that your house is a commercial venture, then it's like a commercial property and you should be selling it with GST on it. Now that doesn't mean you have to tell the end purchaser there's GST. You could just include it in the whole purchase price, but you may have to remit it to the government. So you could have it included and remit it to the government. But if you got a huge GST input tax credit on buying the property, CRA knows it's a commercial venture. So when you're selling it, they're going to want GST to be on it as well. And that's the problem. Like, or, and I, I shouldn't say the problem. I mean, if you want to credit initially, obviously you've said it's a commercial property. You got all your GST back. I prefer not to do that. I would rather just get the new home uh, credit on GST and not have to, you know, remit the whole GST when I sell the property. Because probably it's went up, hopefully went up in value and I'd have more to remit later on. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I got a question for you along those lines. Um, I bought a house and I put a suite in it and rented on Airbnb. And after the fact, I started a corporation for some other things that I was doing. Yep. 
And so I got some advice from my accountant on whether or not the, I should run the Airbnb through the corporation or leave it uh, outside. And she suggested that I leave it outside. I just, I didn't quite understand the reasoning for that. And I wonder if you have any thoughts um, on that. It, it doesn't really matter if it's in the corporation or not in the corporation. So um, there are some reasons for bank mortgages where sometimes I put the Airbnb income in my corporation and do a lease from my corporation to myself. So it looks like I have rent because banks won't take Airbnb income, but that's like just a financing thing. There's no real reason to do it other than that. And I mean, it is more work because if the Airbnb doesn't own the property or sorry, the corporation doesn't own the property, then you kind of have to figure out a way to do the lease to do it in. So she's, because there's not really a benefit to doing it and there's more paperwork, that probably is why she gave you the advice. Because you can register for GST personally for that Airbnb income. You don't have to have that in a corporation to do it. Proprietors, all, like they often register for GST as well. So that might be the reason you were thinking you should put it in the corporation was for GST, but you can do GST as a separate thing for your Airbnb as well. Right. And one more thing. Thanks for that. That's helpful. Um, I wonder if you could comment on people who have a suite or a unit that they're considering whether they're going to rent it out traditionally or short term. And I know you mentioned maybe every five years, there's going to be seven to 10,000 worth of furniture, right? Well, and I, I wouldn't say seven to 10,000. That was my initial setup, but I would say that right. you kind of renew stuff every five years, some of the stuff, depending on the condition of it. So definitely having a, a budget, having a budget of a couple thousand every five years at minimum means you could probably replace some of the items in year five and some more in year six, some more in year seven, just depending on the condition and the quality of what you got, right? Right. I mean, I'm pretty sure my Ikea furniture is probably not going to last as well as my Lazy Boy furniture. So I, I had Lazy Boy, I was able to get a warranty for five years. I think it cost me about $800, but it's for like four bedrooms and two kitchens. So, I mean, it was a, it was a lot of warranty, but uh, Airbnb guests spilled stuff on the carpet. They came and cleaned it. And if they couldn't, I would have got a brand new carpet. I have a stain on a mattress they are going to come clean it or they will give me a new one. So that warranty for five years, like I was like, oh, that's worth it when you have Airbnb property. So some things I would never do personally for Airbnb purposes, sometimes it's very good to do. Any other questions? And I'll put my YouTube channel name in the chat as well, just in case people forget. So I put my website on here as well for lbylrealestate.com. On there, I have links to all the different softwares I used. I already talked about a few of them and gave the links on the slides for pricing and um, communication. But I also have links for travel savings, like home exchange, if you like the idea of that, where you can get a referral code for that. And any other things I use where I think they're valuable, I have a subscription to, um, to a, well, not a subscription. I work with a company that saves you money on cable and internet. So all of my short-term rentals, I call Michael. He, I had $1,000 of telespills every month for all of my properties because I do it because it's cheaper for me to do it and charge it between the two units. I was paying $1,000 after Michael called TELUS, my bill went down to $400 and he takes one third of the savings. So I have a link on my website to him as well. So I have lots of ways I save money and all of them are on my website. No other questions? I think we can go move on. Yeah, I no, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so you said that you sold quite a bit of properties. What was your determining, what's your determining factor when you're buying and selling? And one of them was also in, you said it was in the, that West End near your other properties. So yep. was it so you could buy, like you could buy that property that you had? Is like, Good I'm question. sure there's a lot that goes into it, but I'm yeah, curious. Yeah, I, so I had three garden suites, right? Like one, like I could see in one property, I could see the other two. Like I could be in one and say to the tenant, that one's mine and that one's mine. So they were all together. And then I was building property in Belize where you can't get any financing. And Calvin messaged me and saying, I really need a garden suite property to sell. Do you have any? And I'm like, well, 
you know, I don't want to sell. I have this great one. It cash flows really well. But if you want to buy it and I don't want to pay a mortgage penalty, but if you can give me cash so I can use that to build an extra rental in Belize. So that's why I sold one of those properties was because I needed cash to build one of the tiny homes I did in Belize. Had enough money to build one, wanted to build two, sold a property in Edmonton, built, built an extra one in Belize. And then other properties I've sold were just because one of them was a house I lived in that was a single family home. And I sold another, all my, I've gotten out completely. I have no single family homes anymore. Every single property I own now has at least two properties on every lot. And that was my goal was to have two. So I've one with a basement suite, all the rest have, well, garden suites or tiny homes or in Belize, two tiny homes. And that's the only reason. And for buying, it's just how much money I have. So I would just keep buying them if I had enough money to keep buying. And if I, whenever I have money, I buy a new property. And then every time I sell a property, I usually have some money. So I buy another one. So uh, garden suites, would they be the same kind of rules as getting like a garage suite? Same, same thing. Edmonton calls them garden suites. They used to call them garage suites. Exactly the same. Thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I do have a YouTube presentation on garden suites versus basement suites too. So lots of things that I talk about, I have presentations on YouTube on. All right, I think we're done with questions now. Yeah, it was a great presentation. Okay, thanks Ivan. As always. No, I guess if, I of course, of, of course, reach out to Linda if you have any questions. Uh, she's easy to get a hold of and, uh, and always willing to kind of help out. So good, good source in your back pocket. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to see how to stop the share now. There we go. And one more thing, Linda. Sure. Um, do you, so all your properties you own yourself, right? Yes. But you don't have like a co, someone um, investing through you or anything like that? No, I have in the past. I just haven't now because I, well, I don't know why. I just, I haven't done them all myself. Okay. So then um, I, I was, at, I was in another group too, um, which is a really good group as well. Um, a lot more people are, they have double income, um, single income as well. So um, how do you, because for me, from what it feels like, I have an um, apartment and a three bedroom apartment. I live in a townhouse right now. And then I want to get a house for myself, maybe with a basement suite, maybe with a garden suite now that I've heard, who knows, right? Yep. But I'm going to be restricted by um, my income my own personal income. Yep. Is there another way that I can, I mean, I, I think rental income probably helps eventually, I, I assume. Yes. So, so, is that so? Uh, yeah, when you're, whenever you have rental income, depending on the bank, and this is a good question to reach out to Sean on is every bank has different rules on how they put your rental income into your income. So I, I work with BMO a lot because they have fairly favorable rental rules on what they include in my rental income. So I, I in the past, it was 80%. I don't know. I haven't got a new one with them recently, but they were including 80% of the rental income into my income. And then okay. that, that helped a lot. So, so every bank is different, but certainly it does get hard. And that is where you would want to get joint venture partners. My issue always was I dealt with people I knew that always wanted to, I guess, have input. And I was building new houses and they might want to build it like it was their own. So I just decided mm -hmm. I'm going to do the way I do it. And not a lot of people were building new and doing it now. I mean, I have Zoria and tons of people in my neighborhood that have all the exact same properties I have. So obviously joint ventures could have worked really well. It's just that uh, a lot of people can do the same thing. So it is certainly if you need to do it, absolutely do it. Thank you. It's no refreshing, problem. like, because the uh, others, it's more double income or joint bigger, um, bigger projects. Yeah. And you're probably more aligned to, I kind of want to rely on my own income and my own sources. Yeah. And um, I have a lot of partnerships well. in, I have a lot of partnerships in different ways where 
for example, my property manager in Belize, I do rental videos and she helps me with things. And she's like, let's talk about how I can compensate you. So I do a lot of partnerships in different ways with people. Um, it's yeah. just maybe not with owning property, although in the future I might, but it would probably be a bigger property. I mean, so, yeah. so we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Make it worth future. it, right? When you yeah. do. <laughs> exactly. And plus you're splitting the income between more of you. So you want to make sure you that it makes sense and that more. there's a reason for it. Like I could see myself yeah. doing it more in Belize because people aren't in Belize that might want to invest in Belize and they don't want anything to do with it because it's way more challenging, right? So mm -hmm. that is something I'm more uh, expert on compared to other people. So there I might do more joint ventures versus in Edmonton where, I mean, I'm just building a new house with a basement suite and most people kind of know how to do that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Perfect. And the copy of the slides will be in the recording. So I will definitely put a, um, a comment or a, I guess a, a message on the area uh, website showing where the recording is as soon as I upload it. Uh, on the message, message board. Yeah, on the message board. Thank you, Ivan. I'm like, whatever that's called, the, the site. Yes, I've done that every month. I'll put